All right, physics students, um, this is one of two videos which will round out topic 12.1, which is titled The Interaction of Matter with Radiation. And in these two videos, I'm going to get into um, the ideas of quantum physics. I'm going to talk about uh, Schrodinger's equation, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, and the electron in a box model, as well as quantum tunneling, all right? And I just want to remind you guys that this particular topic, the way that we treat it here in the IB, is a, as sort of a very cursory treatment, sort of the tip of the iceberg. When you get to college and you take a um, quantum physics class, you will uh, you all obviously get into this in much more detail. So what I'm presenting to you now is absolutely sort of the tip of the iceberg. It's really a survey study of this topic. Um, so to start off, I'm going to introduce something to you called angular momentum. Now. Remember we studied linear momentum. We talked about conservation of linear momentum, et cetera, et cetera. Now we're going to talk about angular momentum. Now, you will not have to, uh, on the IB exam, uh, do any derivation of angular momentum or treat it as a vector or, or any such thing. The only reason why I'm introducing it to you here is because it's uh, – sort of an integral thing in terms of understanding how the energy levels um, are related to atomic orbits, uh, the, the radius of uh, orbits of um, electrons, and also to the quantum numbers as you'll see, all right? So if you recall the hydrogen atom, all right? So in the, situ in a, in the case of a hydrogen atom, we have one electron going around a nucleus. Um, and remember also that in the case of an atom, it's not as simple as electrons as planets moving around the sun as a nucleus, for example. There's an electron cloud, as you know, given by orbitals. But anyway, um, so we have the one electron. What is it that keeps it going in a circular orbit, so to speak, is the centripetal force, right, which is the uh, electrical force between the nucleus and the, and the electron. Of course, the radius of that orbit is given by r. Now, if we consider the total energy of the orbiting electron given by kinetic energy plus electric potential energy, it's going to be 1 half mv squared plus negative kqe squared over r, where qe is obviously the, char the elementary charge, the charge on the electron. Um, note the minus sign there, which has to be that way because we um, define potential energy as we did with gravitational potential energy to be zero at infinity and everything under the x-axis. So therefore, the centripetal force acting on the electron would be obviously the uh, electrical force, right? Because QE is the charge of the nucleus and the, and the electron. Uh, the electrical force is equivalent to the centripetal force. Solving for mv squared, we get kqe squared over r. Okay, So if we go back to the and consider the total energy of the orbiting electron, we end up with, after some very simple algebra, we end up with the total energy equals negative kqe squared all over 2r. Okay, Now this should remind you of something else. Remember the relationship between the kinetic energy and the total energy of an orbiting satellite? So in effect, what we're doing is we're treating the um, electron as a satellite that's orbiting another mass. So pretty cool, huh? Now, the idea of angular momentum, it's very similar to linear momentum. We had linear momentum as the product of mass and velocity. Angular momentum is mass times velocity times the radius of the circle in which the thing is moving. And the variable that we give angular momentum in physics is capital L. These are really vectors, but don't worry about the vectors for now because you don't need to uh, worry about that. Notice that the SI units of angular momentum are kilogram meters squared per second. Okay. All right. Now, it was Niels Bohr who argued that the angular momentum is conserved as the electron goes around the uh, nucleus. And it can be shown, his idea was that it can be shown to be an integer multiple of a basic unit called h over 2 pi. All right. This is known as the Bohr condition. So it means that L, which is MVR, is equal to h over 2 pi times some integer n. All right. Now, just doing a little bit of algebra here, if I square both sides and then I rearrange, I end up with mv squared equals kqe squared over r. Uh, and if I solve for the orbital radius, this is the reason why I, I squared both sides is because I wanted to get the mv squared, which looks familiar to you hopefully with the kinetic energy equation. I end up for the orbital radius, I get that r is proportional to n squared. Okay, This is a really amazing 
um, outcome. It means the orbital radius of an electron going around a nucleus is discrete, and it's proportional to n squared. And it's just multiplied by this nasty looking constant right here. This is a really important result. It can also be shown that t squared, the period of an electron going around a nucleus, is proportional to the radius cubed, which should remind you of Kepler. And if you should, uh, if you want to investigate that, it's a very good exercise for you to pause the video and actually show that to convince yourself of that. Okay. Okay. So r is proportional to n squared. If I actually put in numbers for the hydrogen atoms, okay. I can show that r is 5 times 10 to the minus 11 times n squared times meters, okay? Um, now, remembering that we found that expression for the total energy before in the previous slide, if we put in this value for r, okay, we end up with the fact that the total energy of the electron is inversely proportional to n squared. This is another really important result. So the allowed energy of the electron is also discrete. It comes from the fact that the actual radii of the orbits are discrete and this gives rise to the idea of atomic orbitals. If you've taken chem uh, chemistry, you've studied about different orbitals, okay? In this class we talk about different energy levels corresponding to different orbitals, okay? And if we put in, again put in the numbers for the hydrogen atoms, we note that all of this ends up being 13.6 electron volts, which should remind you of something. It means that for the hydrogen atom, we now have an equation that the total energy is negative 13.6 divided by n squared times uh, um, electron volts. That's, that's the unit. That's where those energy level diagram, that energy level diagram comes from for hydrogen. So the next level up, n equals 2, would be 13, negative 13.6 divided by 2 squared, which is 4. That's where those numbers come from. Pretty cool, huh? All right. So this is the mathematical explanation as to why energy levels are what they are and also why they get infinitely closer together as n approaches infinity because you have that 1 over n squared term um, on the right-hand side. Now, it turns out that every atom, every element, has its own equation governing the allowed energy levels of electrons in its orbitals. So, for example, for helium, we have this. For mercury, we have that, etc., etc., which helps to explain, again, those energy level diagrams. Okay, as an example, it's useful for you to show, to verify the electron energy levels for n equals 2 through 4 for hydrogen. So go ahead and pause the video and do that. Okay, very, very simple. So when n equals 2, it's divided by 4, 3 divided by 9, and 4 divided by 16. That's where those numbers come from. So that's pretty cool. Now here's a little more of a, a difficult example. All right. It turns out that before Niels Bohr, Johann Balmer, and if you're in chemistry and if you studied, um, if you studied the different uh, energy levels for... Um, for um, atomic hydrogen, you'll note that there's a, there's a series called the Balmer series. Anyway, he deduced experimentally that the photons emitted in transitions from any level to level n equals 2 have wavelengths that are given by this equation right here where b is just a constant. And I'm asking you here to justify this formula or derive this formula, essentially, and um, find an expression for the constant b. This will take you a few minutes, so go ahead and pause the video and try this before you see my solution. Okay, so the easiest way to think about it is you set up an equation delta E equals E sub n minus E2, okay? Um, so this ends up being after some algebra. By the way, this should be, this term right here should be n squared, or uh, this should be, um, sorry, 2 squared is what that should be, right? So it's 1 over n squared minus 1 over 4. Um, anyway, all of that delta E is going to be hc over lambda because that's the energy of the emitted photon. And then it's a matter of just solving for lambda, uh, where b is all this junk right here, notice that it's of the form n squared over quantity n squared minus 4. Pretty cool, okay? As another example, show that the Bohr condition for the quantization of angular momentum, MVR, is equivalent to 2 pi r equals n lambda, where lambda is the de Broglie wavelength for the electron and r the radius of its orbit, okay? All you do is you use the, um, is you quantify uh, you do what, uh, what Bohr mentioned and you quantify angular momentum as being the integer multiple of this quantity and all you do is you solve for, uh, you can show that lambda is h over mv and you're showing this condition right here. So pretty straightforward stuff, all right? Therefore, all of this means that the allowed orbits of the Bohr model are those for which an integral number of wavelengths fit on the circumference of the orbit. 
That's what this means in this example eight that I've just done for you, okay? This should remind you of standing waves, okay? Notice that if you can adjust, um, adjust the, the size of the circle, for example, um, note that you have to have an integ integer number of wavelengths to fit on the circle in order for the standing wave to be continuous, all right? So for example, this is an electron wave, a uh, wave function for n equals six, and you can see you can count six complete wave uh, wavelengths here. All right. So the extremes, um, the extremes are the amplitude of the electron wave. Okay. Um, so that's kind of how that works. Pretty cool, huh? The electron um, is in fact a standing wave on the circumference of the orbit. And um, just remember, I just want to remind you that when you guys studied standing waves, remember that standing waves don't actually transfer energy. Okay. Uh, this also solves the problem of the electron spiraling into the nucleus, which was a problem with previous models um, of, the, of the atom. The next thing I want to talk about is the work of uh, Schrodinger. Um, and in fact, Schrodinger said, um, okay, so the next thing I want to talk about is the work of Schrodinger. Now remember that we've said that the electron is in fact a standing wave on the circumference of the orbit. Okay. Um, but really, let's, let's talk about what kind of wave this is. Like, is it a wave like an ocean wave, a water wave, um, a wave in a cloud through air? Like, like, what is this kind of wave? Well, the answer is that it's a probability wave. Okay, now it was Edward Schrodinger, who was an Austrian theoretical physicist in 1926. He was the first person to provide a realistic model for this wave. And this Schrodinger theory assumes that there is a wave associated with every particle. In this specific case, I'm talking about an electron. And every um, electron has a wave function. And that wave function is denoted by the Greek letter psi, and it's a function of its position x and time t, and it's denoted by psi x of t. Now, any electron can have different wave functions depending on its state. So for any particular particle or electron, it's not like there's one wave function that defines it at all time, what it's, um, what it's doing, okay? There are a lot of different versions of Schrodinger's equation. For example, here's one here, the time-independent Schrodinger equation. You'll probably study that in college. And it was Richard Feynman who famously said, where did we get that equation from? Nowhere. It's not possible to derive it from anything you know. It came out of the mind of Schrodinger. Pretty cool stuff, all right? Now, this was really weird stuff, and it took the German physicist Max Born to actually interpret it. And he suggested that, well, in order to actually use this for something, he said, okay, the probability that an electron will be found within a small volume delta V, because that's really what we're trying to do. We're trying to explain nature, and we're trying to explain what an electron is actually doing at any moment and where it is. Um, the probability that it will be, be found in a very small volume delta v near position x at time t is itself a function given by p x of t, that's the probability, uh, as a function of uh, position and time of the absolute value of psi squared times delta v. Um, it's not possible, of course, to pinpoint the exact position of an electron. We can only say with certainty that its position has a probability of being near a particular place at a particular time. The IB data booklet gives you this equation right here. In other words, this is the best we can do. The best we can do in terms of describing what an electron is doing is to describe the probability of what it might be doing. This has not changed since quantum mechanics um, first was discovered or invented, depending on how you interpret that, many, many, many years ago. We haven't gotten any closer to figuring out exactly, uh, pinpointing exactly what things like electrons are doing at any specific um, time.